of the Bellany, because we're talking about the massive galaxy sample, kinematics of those galaxies. All right, so I apologize in advance if I start coughing. I've been trying to kick this cough all week and it hasn't quite worked, but I've got spare cough drops, so hopefully we can get through this. Um, so, hold on a second. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'm a sort of newly minted former grad student at UC Berkeley. I've been working with Chung Pei Ma on the massive survey, and um, I'm sticking around for a few more months because they haven't kicked me out yet but I'm going to tell you today about sort of the main results from recent papers in my thesis, which is the correlations between stellar kinematics and environment in massive galaxies. So just a review really quickly of what the massive survey is, which you've probably heard several times before. Um, it is a volume limited survey of um, elliptical and S0 galaxies in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, we go out to about 108 megaparsecs, and it is uh, complete in stellar mass above three times 10 to the 11 solar masses. Uh, maybe the most similar survey to this is the Atlas 3D survey, which goes out to about 50 megaparsecs and is complete above eight times uh, 10 to the nine solar masses. And these are both um, IFU surveys. And they are, of course, not the only two IFU surveys. There's many others. But the similarity and sort of selection here makes them easy to compare. So I'll do that later in the talk. And I also want to mention that for getting kinematic data out of galaxies, if you really want to get the sort of outskirts, large radius, um, globular clusters are also useful for this. So for example, the SLUG survey has done this for some of the Atlas 3D galaxies. All right, so before I get into my work, I want to give a brief advertisement of what else is going on in the massive survey. Uh, we have people working on photometry and um, gas detection and gas kinematics, x-ray properties, radio properties, the initial mass function. So there's a lot going on besides just the core IFU survey. And within the IFU survey, there's also a lot more going on with that data besides just the kinematic work that I've been doing. Um, I also want to advertise that we are currently building our survey website, blackhole.berkeley.edu. And I have a great undergrad working on some magic with interactive plots. Um, so I think I can say once this is up and running, we're gonna have the best survey website that's out there. So look forward to that. All right, so to get into the kinematics, Here's a nice uh, SCSS image of one of our galaxies, NGC 5129. Um, we've got about 90 of the 116 total galaxies observed so far with the Mitchell spectrograph and put through this pipeline to give us the line of sight velocity distribution for each of these spatial bins. Um, there's some basic statistics over there. We have a nice large field of view, um, about 100 arc seconds squared. And we actually measure more than just a Gaussian uh, velocity distribution. We measure deviations from a Gaussian also, which can give very useful information. But for today, I'm going to ignore that completely and just talk to you about the velocity and the dispersion of these galaxies. OK, so the second main ingredient here, as advertised in my talk title, is the galaxy environment. And um, there are many ways to define environment. And they're all pretty much based in this case, or in the work I've done, on the parent sample from the two mass survey. So what I've got here is a map um, where the small white dots are galaxies from the parent sample. Um, the black circles are galaxies in massive, and the small gray squares are galaxies in Atlas 3D. And this is just a slice of the survey volume, which is sort of here, the bottom slice in this diagram. And I'll just give you a quick tour of the rest of our volume. You can see we also have the Coma Cluster and Perseus in our volume. And so the three ways I'm going to quantify environment are first the smooth density field, which is here in the map. And that was calculated or measured in um, this great paper, Caracat 2015. So I've just stolen their numbers wholesale. Um, I'm also using a group catalog, Crook et al. from 2007 to 2008. And that's a group catalog that has an estimate of halo mass for every group with at least three members in this, in this volume. Um, about 20% of our galaxies are isolated. They're not in a group, so they don't actually have a halo mass. And another 20% are actually satellite galaxies. They're paired with another massive galaxy that's even larger in a group. And the remaining 60% are brightest group galaxies. Um, and then third, um, I calculate a local luminosity density within the 10 nearest neighbors. So just a quick comparison to sort of convince you that these are not three redundant things to measure. Um, we've got the smoothed density profile here versus the local density within 10 neighbors. And you can see, so this delta G um, is smoothed over a scale of about five megaparsecs. And 
the density within 10 neighbors can actually probe much smaller scales than that um, because in dense cluster environments, the 10th neighbor can be much closer. So you can see that this dotted line being the one-to-one -one line, they match really well like you would expect, except that at higher densities, um, this new 10, the local density, does a much better job of probing those sort of smaller, very dense areas. Okay, so first let's talk about galaxy spin, how galaxy rotation matches with or correlates with environment. Um, so we've got this lambda parameter that measures galaxy spin. And in principle, the flattening and inclination can be very important if you're trying to figure out the true galaxy spin and not just the projected spin. Um, but it turns out that won't matter for my purposes. So we've divided galaxies into fast and slow rotators according to this dotted line, um, which was sort of calibrated for the Atlas 3D survey um, to take into account this flattening inc inclination. Um, and you can see that the mass of galaxies or the larger circles are on average flatter and there are many more slow rotators in the Atlas 3D sample. Um, but we tested this and it turns out if you use just a flat cutoff in lambda to classify fast and slow instead, things don't really change. So I'm confident in saying we can just sort of use the same classification as Atlas 3D and that gives us a pretty good result. All right, so first, let's ask how galaxy spin correlates with stellar mass. Um, as I said before, many fewer fast rotators among the very massive galaxies. And so we have a nice confirmation this is a very strong trend. Um, there are still a few fast rotators, even at the highest masses. There aren't many, but there are a few. And so now we get into the interesting part, which is how galaxy spin correlates with environment. So what I'm going to assert that this plot shows you is that at fixed stellar mass, the fraction of slow rotators does not depend on environment for any of these environment measures. Um, now you might say, well, okay, like for example, in the left panel, that red line is not exactly flat. And that's true. Um, but keep in mind that these are not sort of delta functions in stellar mass. These are very wide stellar mass bins. So the question I wanna ask is whether this correlation with galaxy environment is actually just a reflection of the very strong correlation with stellar mass and then the correlation between stellar mass and environment. Um, so what I've done is made this sort of Monte Carlo randomized test where I forget the classification of fast and slow rotator for each galaxy and then we'll reassign it based only on uh, these fractions in the sort of finer, three finer mass spins. And so what that does is effectively give, us, effectively give me a prediction of what this line should look like if environment has no additional um, influence on whether a gal galaxy is fast or slow. If the stellar mass correlation is all that matters, you get these um, circular points for the randomized sample. And so what I can say is that if the circular, if the points match the actual fraction, then what it means is that there really is no dependence on environment, a fixed stellar mass and the line or the correlation you see here is just because we don't have enough statistics to break into super fine mass spins. Okay, and I have one more caveat, which is that you might also say in the right panel, for example, there does seem to be some residual difference between this randomized sample and the actual fraction. Um, to which I say, sure, there might be. I would argue that it's still pretty much within errors, but we would obviously need more statistics to see if there really is some residual correlation there. Um, but the main takeaway is that for the most part, any correlations between fast and slow rotator fraction and environment is just a reflection of the correlation with stellar mass. Okay, and finally, I'm going to switch gears and talk about the galaxy dispersion profiles. So what we've got here is just a compilation of the sigma profile for all the galaxies in the sample. And I could talk a lot about how to interpret what these dispersion profiles mean, but if I can just give a recklessly simplified version, um, the thing I want to keep in mind is that for these non-rotating galaxies, um, you don't have a rotation curve to sort of give you what the circular velocity is or what the mass profile is. So instead you look at the dispersion. However, um, the velocity anisotropy, or if you have, for example, a bias towards radial orbits instead of tangential orbits, that can make the projected dispersion or the observed dispersion a lot lower than you would expect, or in some cases higher than you would expect, just based on what the mass profile is. Okay, so with that sort of in the back of my mind, what I wanted to do is just characterize the dispersion profiles for our entire sample. And so I'm just measuring the log outer slope 
of the dispersion profile for each galaxy. And so we've fit each um, profile to a power law. And in some cases, like on the right, it has to be a broken power law, a double power law to sort of match the data. And this parameter gamma outer just measures whether the dispersion is rising or falling at large radius. Okay, so how does this correlate with stellar mass? Um, there's a pretty strong correlation. I think especially if you keep in mind how narrow this mass range is, and we see a really strong correlation in the uh, behavior of the dispersion profile with stellar mass. None of the most massive galaxies have falling dispersion profiles. The rising ones are actually really common at high mass, but for lower mass galaxies, most of them are falling. Um, and one thing to keep in mind here is that you can ask whether um, a bias in the radial coverage of the data might have something to do with this correlation. And that's definitely a concern, which um, I've done a couple of tests, and I don't think the correlation is just from that, but that's definitely sort of a bias to keep in mind. Okay, and so now let's look at how the dispersion profiles correlate with environment, and it turns out there is a strong correlation here as well. So unlike the case with the galaxy spin, um, we can see, especially for M-halo, there is definitely a correlation between the dispersion profile behavior and the galaxy environment. So to just pick out M-halo as sort of a thing to compare with the stellar mass, um, the correlations are qualitatively different. So for stellar mass, there seems to be some sort of minimum cutoff in what the uh, dispersion profile slope can be that increases with stellar mass. Whereas with M-halo, there seems to be some maximum cutoff. The, the slope of the profile cannot be larger than some you know, cut off uh, gamma outer, which increases with halo mass. And so to keep in mind sort of my reckless simplification of how dispersion profiles work, I wonder if maybe this uh, correlation with stellar mass has to do with anisotropy, has to do with maybe more mergers or a longer sort of accretion history, gets rid of dramatic radial anisotropy in galaxies, and so it gets rid of these dramatically falling profiles. And Maybe this correlation with M-halo has something to do with sort of the actual mass profile, maybe for central galaxies, or some like intracluster light component that is actually sort of truly changing what the dispersion is um, without considerations of anisotropy for galaxies and larger halos. And finally, we can also sort of play the same game of a randomized sample um, that we did in the case of spin. So if I take alternately the assumption that the correlation with stellar mass is all that matters, and then randomize the sample with halo mass, we get these black points. Um, and I can actually do the reverse here also and assume that halo mass is the only thing that matters. And in that case, we would expect these gray points to be um, the fraction uh, versus stellar mass. And I would argue that in both cases, there seems to be some residual correlation. Um, it's, it's stronger in the case of stellar mass. Um, halo mass is a little bit more within the error bars. But I think taken all together, this says that there is some sort of independent influence on the dispersion profiles that relates both to stellar mass and to environment or halo mass. Okay, so in summary, I just want to leave you with another advertisement of what's going on in the massive survey. Um, and the points I covered today, we've got kinematics for almost all of the galaxies now. And um, I would say that for the most part, the galaxy spin follows stellar mass only whereas the behavior of the dispersion profile actually follows both math, mass and environment in independent ways. So sort of what's coming up next, why I'm sticking around for a little while, is that I wanna dig more into sort of modeling like mass profiles and estimates of the total enclosed mass to find out what these kinematics really mean in terms of the structure and um, mass of the galaxies. And there are also a whole bunch of other papers coming out on a lot of other exciting topics. So I can connect you with the people working on that if you are interested. And thank you for listening. Yes. I guess the two are actually something independent because something with radio in galaxies where you are, you can see the dominance of the dark matter. So you always love your profile definitely depending on the, 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 the dark matter layer that you are. And in right. and I, uh, mass, the galaxy set is affected also by oscillation, oscillation, and what are the kind of oscillations that the, the, the shape of the profile change in mass, the mm. velocity is affected by the, 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 the,
pattern with an increasing red flag, uh, similarly what the zipper process was. So I think that, that what you're saying in your mm -hmm. exploration really just Right, yeah, I think that definitely makes a lot of sense. Right, I think that makes a lot of sense for this sort of max cutoff, and then you might have to invoke anisotropy as to why so many are far, so far below, but I think that, yeah, definitely makes sense as an explanation, and it's also why I think that um, looking at how far exactly out you've measured the dispersion profile is very important, because we're sort of barely sampling that region where dark matter really begins to dominate. So if you go out just a little bit less far, or a little bit more far, then you know, the situation can be very different. Um, so I think the only thing I've looked at specifically is seeing if it correlates with the sigma profiles much. Um, it doesn't really seem to. There seems to be just kind of an independent kind of small number statistics problem where we don't have very many fast rotators, but they're not particularly special in terms of what their sigma profiles look like. Um, I think there are a lot more things that you can connect it to, which I have not done, but yeah, I think sort of the basic story is that some combination of, you know, merger histories can influence whether something is fast or slow rotator, um, you know, what major versus minor mergers, what the sort of initial parameters are. And so I know that there's a lot of sort of really good work there about, out there about that. And um, yeah, I think that mainly sort of the result here is that it seems for the most part like any way you make a very massive galaxy has an equal chance of giving you a slow or fast rotator, no matter what kind of the merger history or the environment was well not what no matter what the merger history was but no matter what the environment is